So, you're a little shaky on the big moments in history, huh? Like that hellish stretch of World War II, where Hitler's secret vengeance weapons rained down from the sky, nearly ripped victory from the jaws of defeat? Well, not to worry. If you've got just 14 minutes, we here at History in a Hurry will get you up to speed on all the terrifying wonder weapons Hitler pulled out at the end of the war to try to save himself in his thousand-year Reich, or at least help him terrorize and kill as many innocent civilians as possible before he was done. Start the clock. In September 1939, after years of funding a massive program to rebuild his military into the most terrifying fighting force on the planet, Hitler's troops surge into Poland and World War II is on. Within 10 months, Nazi troops have crushed not only Poland, but Holland, Belgium, and France as well. An isolated Britain stands alone, with Hitler's full arsenal aimed straight at her. So dominant is the German military machine that many feel that total Nazi victory over Europe, and perhaps the world, is inevitable. But, as with JLo's marriages or Johnny Manziel's football career, things don't always turn out exactly as anticipated. First, Nazi plans to invade England are abruptly put on hold after plucky British pilots, driven by love of country and way too much for old gray tea, turn back the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. In response, Hitler, seldom known for his patience or reflection, simply jumps ahead to the next name on his invasion dance guard. In June 1941, more than three million German troops roll into Russia, a nation known mostly for its grim literature, its vodka, and for being the endless frozen frontier where European armies go to die. To those who think that by fighting Britain to the west and Russia to the east, the Nazi war machine has possibly stretched itself too thin, Hitler says, Hold my schnapps. In December of that year, following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany declares war on America in support of their Axis ally. Fast forward two years, and the Nazi's once unstoppable juggernaut is beginning to look like frozen sauerkraut. In titanic beatdowns by the Red Army, millions of German troops are killed, surrender, or just freeze to death. We weren't kidding about Russia being to Western armies what slashers are to teen movie slumber parties. <laughs> Meanwhile, British and American troops rout German forces in North Africa before landing in Italy. Worst of all, American and British bombers pound the German homeland around the clock in bombing raids, leaving cities in ruin and German morale in tatters. In the face of such setbacks, a more thoughtful, pragmatic dictator might rethink his approach. Maybe at least redirecting shrinking resources toward protecting his citizens? But of course, that just isn't Hitler's style. Instead, furious and increasingly suspicious of his generals and advisors, he's consumed by his need for vengeance against his enemies and a new crop of wonder weapons which promise to deliver it. The first of these Verkaltungswaffen, that's German for revenge weapon, announces itself with an odd pulsing noise above London's East End on June 13, 1944. But that quirky-sounding engine is deviously deceptive. It powers an unmanned V-1 flying bomb, carrying an 1,800-pound explosive. The V-1 is developed from a pre-war design and uses a gyroscope to keep it flying straight and level for up to 200 miles from its ski-jump-style launchers near the Pas de Calais in coastal France. When the engine quits, it's designed to dive, randomly bringing death and destruction to whatever lies below. The first one comes down on a residential London street, killing six and leaving 300 homeless. Three nights later, the Germans drastically up the ante, firing 244 V1s toward Britain. 73 hit London. The British instantly work on countering these missiles, which come to be known as buzz bombs or doodle bugs, making it the cutest name for a weapon of mass destruction in the entire war. Hundreds of barrage balloons are floated across the approach path to London, draping thick metal cables down to the ground, creating a metal curtain to trap the V1s. 
Pilots flying the fastest British fighters, primarily Supermarine Spitfires, discovered that they can just reach speeds of the V-1s, allowing them to shoot them down. The only hitch? Pumping a stream of bullets into a flying bomb often results in, oh, well, something like that. So instead of meeting their fate like a luckless cartoon character, British pilots decide to wing it, literally. By approaching carefully from the side, steel-nerved RAF pilots use their wings to flip the V-1 just enough to disable the gyroscope, sending the bomb plunging to Earth, hopefully in an unpopulated area. But with the Germans launching an average of 200 V-1s per day during the height of their bombardment, even the most diligent efforts could only stop a fraction of the buzz bombs from getting through. Hitler, known to have gleefully screened newsreel footage of London burning during the Blitz four years earlier, is rumored to watch film clips of the V-1 strikes over and over for his entertainment. There's a reason this guy is history's biggest villain. But most Londoners, having endured the nightly German air raids earlier in the war, steel themselves to this new threat and largely continue about their business. You know those keep calm and carry on posters you see everywhere these days? Well, this is where they originated, with the stoic Brits when their neighborhoods were being blown sky high. These days we say it when Starbucks is out of pumpkin spice. But back to the war. In all, more than 9,500 V1s are launched at Britain, killing over 6,000 people before the Allied ground forces push far enough into France to put Britain out of range. Another 2,500 are launched at Belgium. But by this point, Hitler has an even more diabolical vengeance weapon in his arsenal. Since the end of the First World War, a fascination with rocketry, one of the few areas of aerospace not severely restricted in the terms of the surrender, grips Germany. One 20-something scientist emerges as the Wunderkind, that's German for young genius, of rockets. His name is Werner von Braun, and by the mid-1930s, he's working for the German army, developing small liquid fuel rockets that can reach two or three miles into the atmosphere. By 1943, von Braun heads a huge development team at the top secret Pinamundi Research Facility by the Baltic Sea. There, he oversees the creation of a weapon that seems straight out of a sinister comic book. The Vergeltungswaffen II, or V2, is a 40-foot tall, 14-ton monster rocket powered by liquid fuel and carrying a one-ton TNT warhead. Dual gyroscopes and an accelerometer guide it to the target. On launch, its engine is designed to boost it more than 60 miles up, making it the first man-made object in space. After reaching speeds of more than 3,000 miles an hour, it'll glide to targets up to 200 miles from its pad, its supersonic speed making it impossible to track or intercept. Lucky for the Allies, this kind of epic scientific leap doesn't come without a lot of trial and error. Von Braun himself gripes that they take half a year to build and half a second to explode. But Hitler, having witnessed an early test of the B-2, is convinced that the rocket will change everything, reversing Germany's mounting battlefield defeats with science. Science! In spite of the setbacks, he makes the V-2 a top priority, diverting desperately needed funding from boring old war stuff like tanks, new fighters, or new anti-aircraft guns. Now, it should go without saying that testing, launching, and occasionally blowing up a series of 46-foot futuristic rockets isn't easy to do without attracting attention, even out on the Baltic Sea coast. Soon, Austrian resistance groups and Allied intelligence get a clear picture of just what Werner is up to. Beginning in the summer of 1943, Allied heavy bombers begin making raids on Pina Monday, killing senior scientists and doing serious damage to test stands and launch pads. As a result of the Allied attacks, Hitler directs Heimlich Himmler, the head of the SS, to relocate production for the V-2 to deep underground factories inside mountains in central Germany. The largest of these is Middleworks, a complex in the Hartz Mountains. And for labor, the SS supplies thousands of prisoners from the Middlebau Dora concentration camp. They're forced to work for months without seeing the sky, malnourished, under backbreaking conditions, leading to a staggering death toll. On September 8, 1944, the first V-2 is launched toward the recently liberated Paris from one of the mobile launchers created to keep V-2s hidden from Allied eyes. Two days later, the first of more than 1,100 V-2s is fired at Britain. Naturally, the British are stunned by this weapon, which arrives without even a moment's warning. Is Hitler's dream of an unstoppable weapon of malice and revenge 
guaranteed to terrorize the enemy into submission finally come true? Well, not exactly. First, the British take some relief in the poor performance of the V-2's guidance system. Many fall harmlessly in the countryside, far off course. Ultimately, the unstoppable advance of Allied ground forces across Europe and into Germany itself pushes the V-2 launch sites further and further from their targets. In all, V-2s killed 2,754 Londoners in total, along with further casualties in Belgium, including 567 dead when a V-2 hits a packed Antwerp movie theater. Perhaps the grimmest statistic of the entire V-2 program is the estimated 10,000 slave laborers who die in the underground assembly plants. While the V-2 represents the apex of Hitler's vengeance program, it isn't the end of the line. No, the little corporal has one more Vergeltungswaffen up his later hosen. That final vengeance weapon is built on the long German fascination with super guns. Because, well, what's more on brand for the Nazis than a giant, meticulously engineered gun built to terrify your enemies by raining down shells the size of Volkswagens from 30 miles away? Going back to the First World War, German enemies often found themselves on the wrong side of giant rounds thundering down from the likes of Big Bertha, the Paris gun, and a quarter century later, Hitler's own rail-bound monstrosity, the Gustav gun. But the V3 is designed to dwarf them all. On paper, this giant five-barrel colossus, built into a mountainside with only the muzzles protruding, is designed to fire 300-pound explosive shells at a rate of 600 per minute. The targets, sitting up to 100 miles away, likely be vaporized in this solid wall of destruction. The secret technology that makes it possible is 32 solid rocket fuel booster valves located along the 430-foot barrel, timed to fire electronically just as the shell goes by. A prototype V3 is able to fire shells up to 55 miles in tests, but demolishes one of the barrels in the process. Still, raging revenge waits on no man, so in 1944, work on an operational version begins back at the Pas de Calais on the coast of France. Lucky for England, the war ends before work is completed on the V3 gun. Yet, in a twist of fate, while never firing a single shot, the V3 may have impacted history as much or more than any of its vengeful stablemates. You see, spotting all the excavation and construction at the V3 site so near the coast of France, US intelligence assumes the Germans are building a hardened launch site for V1s or V2s. This makes it the perfect target for a secret weapon of their own, Operation Anvil. In it, the US will load aging heavy bombers with 10 tons of high explosives and have two brave men pilot the flying bomb partway to the target, then bail out. This will allow radio control from a second plane to guide the bomb onto the site. Tragically, on an attempted strike on the V-3 construction, the robot aircraft detonates prematurely, killing the pilots. One of them is Joseph Kennedy Jr the eldest son of Joe Kennedy Sr., the U.S. ambassador to Britain, who has been groomed by his father to be the first Catholic president of the U.S. 16 years later, his brother, John F. Kennedy, having inherited his brother's presidential ambitions, will declare, We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Ironically, the man to whom Kennedy will entrust this challenge is a very familiar name. Werner von Braun. Hitler's prized rocket man is the source of a mad race between Russia and the US to capture the brains behind the V2 along with his team. A few years of heavy scrubbing and NASA public relations are all it takes to remove that Nazi past like a charm. The legacy of Hitler's vengeance weapons program is a complicated one. While it pushed science and technology to new heights, the intended victims mostly took the damage the V weapons caused in stride having suffered far worse at the hands of old-fashioned weapons. Meanwhile, the greatest victims were the forced laborers who died constructing the superweapons, along with the German people themselves. In the end, the estimated $2 billion cost of Hitler's program likely accelerated the Allied victory, not to mention Hitler's own demise, by starving the German troops of conventional weapons when they needed them most. Stop the clock. Okay, not too bad. We made it by five whole seconds. We hope you enjoyed this fast-forward take on Hitler's vengeance weapons. And if you're interested in the secret race that led to a Nazi sending America straight to the moon, keep an eye on this space as we'll be featuring that in a future video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and leave a comment, it helps us grow. Thanks for watching.